Hello, everyone. My name is Jessica Kim, and I am the author of debut middle grade novel, Stand Up Yumi Chung, and I'm so excited to be here with Book Your Summer Live. Yay! Before we, uh, today I had the pleasure of uh, chatting with some phenomenal authors about writing the perfect children's book. Uh, before we begin, can we take a minute to introduce ourselves and share maybe a line or two about um, our latest books? Um, why don't we begin with Lorelai? My name is Lorelai Sovereign. And my book is The Circus of Stolen Dreams, which is releasing on September 1st from Philomel. It's a story about a girl who is deeply saddened by the disappearance of her brother, and she tries to run away and escape from her pain in a circus filled with dreams and nightmares and immersive experiences filled with magic and wonder. But she quickly learns that running away from her sadness isn't exactly the escape that she thought. And she learns also that the circus might not be as wonderful as she initially perceived it to be and that it might actually be a trap and that her missing brother might be there as well. Rebecca? Hi, I'm Rebecca Stead. Um, this is my most recent novel for middle graders. It's called The List of Things That Will Not Change. And um, it tells the story of B, who's our main character, um, B's uh, fifth grade year. And it's a big year because her dad is, her parents are divorced and um, her dad is marrying his boyfriend. And this is big for B because she has very high hopes that she is going to become sort of um, Insta sisters with Jesse, who is her dad's boyfriend's daughter. Um, and because these feelings come in size large or extra large, um, there's a lot of exploration of internal experience and the maybe lately all too familiar experience of being kind of overwhelmed by your feelings. Um, and that just came out in April. All right, uh, I guess I'm next. Um, my name is Michael Buckley, and my new book is Finn and the Intergalactic Lunchbox. It's um, the story of a boy named Finn who um, uh, has a, a unicorn lunchbox that opens up shortcuts to different parts of the universe. And um, he uh, has a lot of fun with this, um, with his buddies Lincoln and Julep and a uh, seven foot glitchy robot named High Beam until the people who own the, ro uh, the lunchbox um, come looking for it. And it's a group of uh, giant evil talking uh, locusts um, who realize that Earth uh, looks pretty delicious and um, they're gonna come for the lunchbox and destroy the planet as well. So. Finn and his friends have to use all of their uh, brains and talents to uh, save the planet and kick some bug butt. <laughs> well, um, hi, I'm Aisha Saeed, and uh, my latest book is this one, Diana and the Island of No Return. It just came out a few weeks ago. Um, it's the first in a three book series of Young Diana. Wonder Woman before she knows she's Wonder Woman. And so book one follows her wanting to be a warrior, wanting to be like the other Amazons, but her mother says she's too young and she can't do that. And so it follows what happens when unexpected situations arise. A mysterious boy shows up. The women on the island fall asleep mysteriously and can't be awoken. And it's up to Diana to save the day. So that's what that one is about. And Jessica, do you want to share a little bit about what your book is about? Oh, thank you, Aisha. Yes, <laughs> uh, my book is about an 11 year old girl named Yumi, who is a little shy and a little awkward. And she's having a tough time making friends at her private school. Um, and she is obsessed with stand up comedy, despite her immigrant parents wishes. So it's kind of a story <laughs> about her leading this double life and how she has to untangle herself from all the deception. 
Um, but thank you for asking. Um, yeah. <laughs> all these books sound so amazing. We've got uh, robots and Wonder Woman and Insta Friends <laughs> and we have Nightmarish Circuses. This is amazing. We're going to have such range here. But um, I figure since we're all middle grade authors, um, it would be great if we could uh, start by talking a little bit about middle grade as an audience. So many people consider middle grade to be this golden age of reading because this is the period where a lot of people uh, become lifelong readers. Um, can you tell us why uh, you decided to write for this audience? And we'll start with Lorelai and we'll go around. I decided to write for middle grade uh, for a lot of reasons. My first manuscript was a bit older and I quickly realized that I needed to age down. First of all, I spent many years as an elementary and middle grade teacher. So I have experience with kids in the classroom. I love kids. I have four kids of my own who, the oldest of whom is just starting to broach that middle grade age and as far as her reading. And I also, just like you said, I wanna write middle grade because those are the books that formed me as a reader. Um, it's the time in our lives where I think we start to really figure out who we are as people and books can help us along that process. I also think that the middle grade years are a time where a lot of kids deal with some really difficult life things for the first time. And middle grade novels are just such a beautiful way to find some escape or find some magic or to feel less alone or to see something really difficult be tackled in a way that um, lets you understand it better, understand yourself better, but it also always has this pulse of hope underneath it. There's this hope in middle grade. And I just, I can't let it go now that I've started writing middle grade like this. This is where I hope to be for a while. <laughs> Rebecca, what about you? Um, I think it's my turn. I, I feel, um, you know, the same largely. I, I agree with everything that Lorelai just said. And um, I will add though that I didn't, I didn't really decide to write for middle graders. Um, it, it happened without my realizing it. Um, I knew I was writing for young people, but I, I just had no idea. I didn't know what a middle grade book was. I didn't know what a YA book was even, um, like 15 years ago when I started writing for kids. And um, so in a way that was very lucky because I had this freedom to just sort of write the story, write the character. I didn't have any sense of what my characters were allowed to think about or what was too dark or what was, you know, too innocent. I just sort of um, tried my best to get inside the experience of being 12 again. And um, I feel like that was a really nice way to enter the world of writing for children um sort of without any preconceptions and i still encourage people you know i encourage people to do that when i talk to people who are writing just not to worry about the categories and you know to write write the story that feels the truest uh even if it's fantasy it doesn't matter you know it's the truest in in terms of character Uh, hi, I'm, I, this is a question I get asked a lot and like, why do I write for this age group? And I think it is because I think it's the most important period in a kid's life at, as a reader. And like, we definitely celebrate those kids who become readers, but we oftentimes dismiss and forget the kids who turn away from books, um, which is most of the kids. And um, I was one of those kids when I was this age, uh, I couldn't stand going to the library. Most of the books that were given to me were, I found them boring and tedious and very heavy handed moral lessons and very preachy. And uh, all I really wanted was something for a rainy day, something that would entertain me and make me laugh and, and spark my imagination. And I think maybe that's why I have always loved this category and why, um, even though I, I read everything, uh, I tend to find myself reading middle grade books, not only for the profession, but because I enjoy them. 
Um, I, I agree with uh, Loralee. There's a lot of hope in these stories, and that's something, you know, I think kids could use a lot more of these days. And uh, so I feel like, you know, like my personality was suited for this. Uh, I always had a big imagination. Um, I like to think I was funny. Um, and mm -hmm. writing for that kid, writing for the kid I used to be is, is really why I do it. Yeah, I think um, my experience is really similar to yours, Rebecca, where I went into writing um, not, uh, actually, I went into writing stories thinking I was going to write adult stories. And my very first story, which was published, Written in the Stars, was a young adult, but initially it was an adult book. And um, I had gotten an agent, secured representation of it as an adult book. And then as she read it, she said to me, you know, even though I know you want to write an adult book, like this is what your plan was, this is a young adult book because of the worldview of this character and the voice of this character. And so I, um, I sat down and reread it. I, I went in and started reading a lot of young adult books and I realized, oh my gosh, she's right. This is not an adult book. This is a young adult book. And so um, Written the Stars became a young adult book. And after my debut published, I was working on Amal Unbound. And because I had written a young adult book, I was like, okay, I guess my next book will be a young adult book because that's what I do. I wrote a young adult book. And as I wrote it, it just, something fell off. Um, as I wrote it, it just, and I couldn't put my finger on what it was exactly. And when I turned in the manuscript to Nancy, at Nancy Paulson Books, um, she said, Aisha, you know, this is a middle grade story. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, really? I, you know, I just, I, it was just the voice. So really for me, it comes down to the voice and I, I don't really have a whole lot of control over the voice with Amal Unbound. I kept trying to make it a young adult. I kept trying and trying and it just wouldn't work. And so, um, so then I realized this is meant to be a middle grade story. And I have definitely fallen in love with middle grade. I, you know, like writing Diana and the Island of No Return. It was so much fun to explore coming of age. I love that part of writing middle grade so much, but, but each story tells me what it's going to be. So like I've written picture books, I write young adult. It's each story will tell me what it wants to be. And I follow what that story tells me and what the voice tells me. That's so amazing. Everyone's had such different ways to come around to middle grade. Um, so some might say that the period between age eight and age 12 um, provides some of the most memorable and also traumatic <laughs> times in a person's life. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of reasons for that. They're starting middle school and puberty and changing friends. Um, so much going on that it makes sense that a lot of kids turn to books for comfort. Um, are there any books from your own childhood that left an impression on you? Or um, are there any more recently published books that you wish existed when you were a kid? Uh, let's start with Rebecca this time. If you could unmute your mic for us. That's the problem with muting. <laughs> um, yes. Um, so I was a big reader as a kid. Um, I grew up as um, an only child with divorced parents. So I had a lot of time alone. Um, and I, I spent a lot of time reading and I read a lot of different things. Um, I liked reading books about uh, kids that, who I could identify with. Um, so like um, Harriet the Spy, for instance, um, is, was a book that I really loved as a kid. And I read the others, of course, too, in the series. And I, um, I actually really love Louise Fitzhugh's writing to this day because I feel like she doesn't um, over explain when she writes. She just lays out um, sort of the, you know, the internal life in, in that case in particular of her characters and, and allows the reader to draw her own conclusions about um, you know, why or, or leaves the reader room to have opinions and thoughts and just an experience all her own. And that is sort of one of my sort of foundations of writing for kids is um, to, res 
to respect uh, my readers, you know, from page one to try to explain as little as possible. In fact, I do whole revisions where all I do is take out words. And I feel like um, Harriet the Spy is a sort of great example of a book that is not afraid of its weirdness. Um, you know, Harriet's a really unusual kid. There are scenes that are um, surprising and no one, you know, no one is unpacking it for you in a way that makes you feel like um, anyone is trying to lead you to have a certain thought or belief. And that is something that I really love about um, her writing. Um, but I also read other stuff like science fiction. I loved Robert Heinlein. I loved Madeline Langle. Um, I also really loved, um, this is not written for children, but Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings was a book that had a big effect on me when I was young. Um, and um, really, I don't know, was uh, one of the, my first experiences of being really, um, I would say sort of utterly transported by, um, you know, a, an autobiography. And um, yeah, I mean, I could go on, but I, I have to say that I am very excited by how publishing has changed. I mean, I'm 52, so I was reading these books, you know, the books I loved, I was reading 40 years ago. And although there were fantastic books in the 70s, um, Norma Klein and Judy Bloom and, you know, E.L. Konigsberg, I, I, you know, the, it's really hard to come up with diverse titles that I read as a kid, although I lived in a place where that should have been available to me. I went to a super diverse elementary school. I lived in a really diverse neighborhood. But when I went to the bookstore around the corner, um, there were not a lot of diverse titles for children. And so that is something um, that you know has really shifted uh, in a meaningful way and is something that is really just exciting to see. Um, in, in my case, I think that, I mean, I, I can point to one person that had the major, well actually two major influence on me. Um, uh, Beverly Cleary, um, especially The Mouse and the Motorcycle was a, was it like a sea change in my life? Um, I like to joke with kids that most of the stuff they gave us to read when I was a kid was about a, somebody having to shoot their dog. Um, <laughs> and so it was, it was very nice um, to have run away, like Runaway Ralph and then like the mouse and the motorcycle it was just pure silly adventure. Like that was just so exciting to discover something like that. Um, and that led me to probably my biggest influence is Ralph Dahl, who I mean, James and the Giant Peach and, and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and like, you know, like the, the um, I mean, everything that he wrote is just the witches. It just, he's just got such a gigantic catalog and they're all so wildly different from one another. Like though you can sense like it's him. I mean, when you read it, you know, it's like, yes, this is his voice. And like, no matter what he wrote, but like, he never really played in the same playground twice. Um, it was always a different thing. I think he only wrote one sequel um, the entire time he was writing. And so like that, that kind of stuff. So, you know, I think as I got older, you know, the things that I gravitated towards, like, like Tim Burton films, um, you know, just like seemed to be a natural progression for me of like the bizarre, um, things that I loved as a kid. So anything that was kind of weird or quirky or or even a little subversive, because I think Raoul Dahl could, could say a lot of things that were, that m many of us would probably find, you know, inappropriate if somebody said them to our child. Um, but like he just had a way of getting points across. And I also get the impression, and, I, and for some reason I loved this, I don't know if this is true or not, but I didn't get the sense that he really liked kids. Like, like there was there was always something terrible happening to the children in these stories, and many of these things were like they didn't change back. I mean, like in the the witches, what happens to the kid? It's just shocking that there is no like reversal of fortune. Um, 
I mean, that's outrageous. Like, could, I don't even think an editor would let you publish a book like that now. But, but I loved that. I loved that, like, I was dealing with an adult and um, who was telling me a funny story. And, and, that's, and that, that's the kind of stuff that has really inspired me. But, like, today, I mean, there's so much stuff. I mean, I, I kid uh, with children a lot. You know, that when, when I was a kid, there was, like, one dusty shelf of children's books in the back of the... Uh, you know, whatever bookstore we, we managed to find. And, um, you know, now there's like entire stores just dedicated to them and there's the zillion points of view. And, and I love that. But I think the book that I've read recently that re I wish I'd had when I was a kid is um, The City of Ember. Um, the very first one is really one of the most beautifully plotted out stories I think I've ever read. I mean, I, 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 I read it a couple of times recently and just been dumbfounded by how well thought out that world is. I mean, that's an in incredible example of world building. What about you, Aisha? Um, I think um, for me, I grew up reading um, Nancy Drew books. I grew up reading The Babysitter's Club, Sweet Valley Twins, Sweet Valley High. Um, very kind of plot-based books. Like I remember like, you know, there's lots of stuff happening in them and there's just, you know, there's drama and, and there's always something happening. And then I remember, I don't know how I came across um, Irene Hunt's book, Up a Road Slowly. And I... Um, and it was this book that just, it's about this girl who's lost her mother and has to go live with her aunt in, um, in the country. And like nothing happens really. <laughs> like she just lives with her aunt. She has issues with her aunt. She talks to her uncle. She deals with a new marriage in her, you know, that her father has, but none of it is dramatic and suspenseful or cliffhangers. It's just her life. And I remember I just finished that book and I opened it back up and I read it again. And I just could not, like, I still have that book. I actually didn't return it to the library. I put it under my mattress and I was like, I don't know where it went. So my parents had to pay for it and I still have that book. Um, and I think that book really, <laughs> that book really taught me about um, how character stories can really grip you and can really stay with you. Um, plot, suspense, those are all great too. I love, like Wonder Woman is very suspense and cliffhangers, but I also learned through Upper Road Slowly that you also want characters in those stories, even if there is plot and there's lots of suspense. The way that you care about somebody in a story is by rooting for them, maybe even rooting against them, but you, you, have to, you have to be somewhat invested. And that book really taught me that. And definitely growing up, there was no diversity in my books that I read. And I, you know, I'm sure there were out there. There were probably a few out there. I just never had access to them. I was uh, in my master's degree in education when I saw the very first book, that had a Pakistani girl on the cover, and I'm Pakistani American. And so it wasn't until then, I always wrote stories just for myself, but I never ever featured people that look like me in those stories. It just never occurred to me because I'd never seen it. And it was when I saw that um, book, it was Shabanu, Daughter of the Wind. I thought, oh, so we can do this? We can, there's an interest in, in my stories? And that's when I started writing. And so I'm really glad that there are more diverse titles out there because kids can have that aha moment so early that they won't even know it's an aha moment. It'll just be part of their life. That's my hope. What about you, Lorelai? So many books. Um, but I think <laughs> the one, when I saw this question, the one that really stood out first to me was actually a picture book, Owl Moon by Jane Yolen. My dad used to read that to me as a really small kid and just his cadence and his rhythm and the pictures and just the quiet story that was there has stuck with me so much that I actually snuck it into my debut novel. <laughs> so there's a little moment at a very emotionally poignant spot for my main character where that little snippet appears um, because I, I wanted it to live on. We read that book to our kids, but I wanted to put it in my book too. That's how much that really stuck with me. Um, as far as middle grade-ish books go, Bridge to Terabithia was the first book that made me feel really deeply about a story. My daughter actually just read it and it was the first book that really did that for her too. She's just coming into middle grade, um, coming out of early chapter books. And 
she came down with like tears in her eyes. So it was kind of cool to have that shared experience with her. A Wrinkle in Time was one of the first books that transported me to a new world where I lost track of time while I was reading it. And also The Babysitter's Club. I loved it so much. Those books came into my life at a time when my childhood had become very unpredictable. And they were this constant steadying thing. I was in this subscription for them. I got four books every month. I had close to a hundred at one point, but I just devoured them <laughs> because it was this, this thing I could count on. I could count on these characters and this safe world. And it was just really a, like a harbor and a refuge for me. And then there was also this whole point of time in my middle grade years where I just checked out ghost stories from the library and just read ghost stories. I just wanted to creep myself out. And that has made its way into my writing too. <laughs> Definitely leave it a little bit creepy. And as far as books today, there are so many. I just love reading middle grade for fun. I really think I would have devoured Furthermore and Witchwood. As a child, I devoured it. As an adult, they're just beautiful fairy tale bigs, you know, but also heartfelt character, you know, stories too. And The Girl Who Drank the Moon would be another one. And then really anything by Jonathan Augier, The Night Gardener scared me and in the best of ways. And I would have loved that as a kid too. And then for my own childhood, I would have loved if Donald Cruz, um, all of his stuff was like, it was coming out when, when I was young, but I wish I had had access to it. Like you all said, I had a, a hard time thinking back and seeing a lot of diverse books in my life. And when I became a teacher and I worked in schools where I had diverse students, I had to work really hard to build classroom libraries that represented the students um, that were in my classroom so they could see themselves. And I'm so thankful that that is becoming easier and just more the norm today. Awesome. Actually, that's a perfect segue because the next question is a, a lot about what we've already covered, which is about the evolution of children's literature um, and uh, the ways that it's changing um, from the time we were kids. I, I wanted to extend that question a little further and ask, um, how does that affect the way we interpret the classics of the past, uh, particularly some of the more problematic aspects of some of the stories we enjoyed as children? So we're going to start with Michael. Oh boy, I'm not sure I should be the first one to answer this, but uh, um, I, you know, I, I have, I don't know, we, we live in, in a strange time where there isn't a lot of efforts to understand. You know, it's like you're either right or we cancel you. And um, and I think that they're, they're you know, they eventually, you know, I think a hundred years from now, somebody's going to pick up some of our books and start looking through them and going, oh, I'm not sure about this. I, I think that the intent matters. I think um, um, what the author meant should count. And, um, but at the same time, you know, there's plenty of things out there that, you know, have been around long enough and it's okay to let them go. Um, but I don't know, I just, it's such a strange time. Kid, Kidlet has, has gone through a lot of earthquakes, I think, in the last few years. And um, I think we're eventually going to wind up in a really great place. But it has definitely been a, a ride, I, I would think. Um, I think, you know, the best evolution that has occurred, I think, is the, um, is the diversity has, has become the, the king, uh, uh, the king of, it, of it all. I, I think um, uh, when I first started, um, there, were, there were not a lot of diverse books out there. Um, I published a book, uh, a series of books called Nerds a few years ago. Um, there are five of them, and, and four of the books had, um, they all had different main characters. Four, and four of them, well, there was an African-American boy, there was a, there was a Korean-American girl, there was a, a Jewish-American um, and, and who was also uh, had a family, was partly Catholic. Um, there was a Mexican-American boy, and um, 
you know, there was some pushback from, from a lot of really well-intentioned people that like these books wouldn't sell. Um, if we had an African-American boy on the cover, this was going to be a problem. Um, but I, I, I come from a very diverse family. I have nieces who are African-American. Um, a big portion of my family is, is from China. So I was just like, these kids need heroes. They need to see themselves on the cover of a book. And I'm not going to let you change anything to, to, to make the sales department happy or, or whatever weird um, prejudice or even stereotype that outdated stereotype. So I, I, you know, I put my foot down and, and, and the books wound up being successful in spite of all those people. And uh, so I think that like, we have to remember, it's like, you know, when we're trying to lure children into being lifelong readers, we have to show them who they are but uh, or who they can be in these books but we also have to one thing that i hope that will become a bigger part of, of publishing is one you know all the authors are becoming very diverse and that's amazing and they're producing amazing bodies of work but the people in the publishing houses are not what i would call a good example of of the american melting pot and like there's it's predominantly one type of person. And um, I think, you know, it's very hard to advocate, I think, for those kids if the people at the very top don't look like those kids. And um, I think that's essential. Um, and two, I, I'm hoping what we'll do, and I'm, I'm starting to see it, especially on this panel um, and, and some of the panels I've been on lately, is that not only do we need diverse books, we need di books with diverse topics. And what we tend to do is produce a lot of books for a certain kind of kid that are all about the exact same thing. And I think this is doing a lot of damage to our readers because who wants to keep reading about um, the same kind of challenges? And, I'm, and I am pushing, you know, like in this diversity world that we should be having the African-American Harry Potter and that we should be having some kind of Asian American um, series of unfortunate events. We need these big tentpole books that have kids from all over the world and all, and all different cultures and look completely different. You know, like we need that, you know, more than, more than anything. It's like we, we tend, like I said, we tend to, to write the same kind of theme, same kind of concept, same, storyline for, for these kids and we we expect them to keep reading it over and over and over and they're just they're not going to and eventually they're going to turn away from this so we have to start producing the superheroes for them the wizards the time travelers those kids need those heroes thank you Michael. yeah what about you? i i think i i'd like to um talk next if it's okay yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I think that, um, I think that, yes, when I look back at some of the books that I read, um, especially when I went back to read them with my sons, oftentimes I was horrified at <laughs> some of the things that were in them that I was, I was taking in. Um, you know, I will say that, like, for example, Aladdin, the movie, the cartoon, I loved it as a kid. I was like, wow, there's a brown girl. She's, a, she's like on screen. She looks kind of like me, wow. And then as an adult, I saw her and I saw this movie and I saw so many harmful stereotypes that I hadn't noticed before. And, um, and so, yes, I think it's really important to examine problematic books and problemat problematic content. And I, it's really cool because I got to write Aladdin Far From Agrabah for Disney and they, made a new movie which addressed and fixed so many of those harmful stereotypes you know and they had consultants this time so they got it right this time and i think um i think we do need to examine the past books and i also think intent does not equal impact and um a child reading a book in a classroom isn't going to google and find out what that author meant they're going to see what that book said. 
and that book is going to affect them. And as a Muslim American, reading books that other people have written about me, they may have had good intentions, but they were hurtful. And I think that still matters. And it matters to me as an author. If I write something and somebody says that it hurt them, that they didn't like it, that it was problematic to them, they're entitled to that. My intent does not, in, does not equal their, their impact. And I also want to say that, yes, we do need more books. We need all different kinds of books. But I also want to add that there are those books out there. They just often don't get that push and that visibility. Um, for example, um, Akata Witch, like you talked about Harry Potter. We need like African-American Harry Potter. Akata Witch is a wonderful magical story. L.L. McKinney, A Blade So Black as a retelling of Alice in Wonderland, um, they're out there. They just sometimes don't get that push. They don't get that visibility, but there are those joyful stories and adventurous stories featuring diverse kids. Um, and I will say that even though I think as authors, um, we're in sort of a bubble um, because we are aware of all the latest publishing news and updates. And so we're like, oh yeah, diversity is everywhere. It's all over. But when you look at the CCBC, the you know um, Cooperative Children's Book, they they have compiled the statistics. Statistics don't line up with what our bubble sees of diversity in children's books. And so, um, you know, when I go to the library and just look around and just randomly pick books off the shelves, they're not reflecting that diversity. I think we've come a long way from where we are, and that's wonderful. But um, when I look at the raw stats, the hard facts of it we have a long, long way to go. So, yeah. Thank you, Aisha. What about you, Lorelei? What do you think? Um, I think that a lot of my spot is to listen and to learn from people who have had experiences other than me. And I can't help but think of this through the lens of both like a writer and as a parent and as a former classroom teacher and trying to make sure that I write the stories that are mine to tell and that I also make sure that my world represents the diversity of the world that we live in, in, um, in all of its beauty. I also think as a parent, like when I'm reading with my kids, making sure that our library at home represents the diversity of the world and all of its beauty. And when my kids read something, like I'm, I'm pretty, careful, they're very young right now, um, to have discussions. If I find out that something they've got or have heard or have read through school has some problematic stuff in it, we have a discussion. And my husband kind of laughs sometimes at how much we stop and, and have a discussion about something because there are a lot of books that I loved as a kid, like Secret Garden. I loved The Secret Garden. It's really problematic in a lot of areas and it's a classic. And so I haven't had my daughter read that because I, I don't know that, um, I don't know, I, that, that's something that's really, um, there's a lot of tough stuff in there. And if I did have her read or if she did want to read it, that, that would be a discussion. I think that um, as writers, it's really important for us who have um, been represented well to uh, be part of the change and support that where we can and as much as we can. And I do think that retiring some of those problematic stories and creating space for titles to have the ability to be seen like and recognized like they should be is also a, a good step. Rebecca? I feel the same way. Um, I'm not, a, I just can't really get too interested in the idea of saving kind of, you know, um, preserving um, a lot of interest in classics for kids that, that um, have harmful representations in them. Because I honestly, I mean, really, when you're talking about books for children, you're, it's, it's, it's storytelling. I mean, and, and I feel like, um, there's an insidious quality to a book that delivers a message that um, privately and that directly into a ch child's mind. And there is no, there's no getting at that. I mean, the idea of historical context and understanding what was going on in that time doesn't 
seem like a compelling thing to me. And I mean, I, if people stop reading my books in the future, I would not have a problem with it at all because I feel like the stories we tell and, and particularly the stories we tell children um, is something that should be like a live wire. You know, it should be just always moving and kind of alive with ideas and, you know, sort of currents of imagination, um, you know, and, and something that's sort of fed by as many people as possible. And a lot of that I think has to do with what Aisha said and, and showing like kids that um, they have something to say, you know, no matter how much money they have or what they look like or what part of the world they're from or what their sexual orientation is or whether they get around on two legs or wheels and all of that stuff. Um, it's, it's hard for us to see, I think, um, even when we're looking for it, even the people on this panel who care about this stuff, probably more than 99.5% of people right? Um, we care about children's books and stories um, enormously. And yet there are things that I know I miss because I've had a lot of conversations with people where I see like, oh, I, you know, I miss that. And I think of myself as someone who sees a lot. But what I've learned is that, um, you know, we're all sort of you know, victims is a heavy, <laughs> heavy word for it. But we're all limited um, by our, our points of view to some extent. And, and that is why it's important to read so widely. That's why it's important. It's not just important, you know, for, for kids, you know, um, like er every kid needs a diverse bookshelf. Um, and I guess I, I don't really care about the idea of a classic book. Um, and I, I don't think there is such a thing as a canon um, in children's books. I think this is like a, a living force almost that we collectively sort of generate and offer to young people. And um, it's too important to kind of cling to ideas about what's good and we need to shift. And I also agreed that, that the statistics are showing us that even though we know there's more out there, it's it's not as much as um, you might think. And just, you know, reading stories, of, there's so much coverage of diversity in children's books now. It's like anything, you know, when you read a lot of stories about something, you think, oh, this is everywhere. But in reality, you know, you need to step back and really see um, what's happening. And I also agree with Michael that, you know, the publishing houses themselves, um, need to change in in terms of their makeup and that that is the only way um and agents too i should say and and that is the only way um that we're going to see deeper change thanks and um i'd also yeah sorry go ahead, sorry no, go ahead okay. jessica no no go ahead. i also just wanted to just kind of add on the topic of um cancel culture because i know that that is something in the children's literature world that is really being talked about and um i just my perspective on it is this it's that when i was a kid if i read a problematic book as a teen or show which i saw many <laughs> i my recourse was to vent about it with my friends tell my parents put it away just keep it in there was nobody there to give me a microphone to say hey this this representation you did of me terrorist number three on this show like that that that's not cool there was no one to hear that um now thanks to social media thanks to twitter these other mediums we can say so marginalized communities have a voice um when JK Rowling has come out with her transphobic statements, people from that community and allies of that community can say so, can say, hey, that's mm -hmm. not cool. 20 years ago, nobody could have done that. And that her voice and her point of view would have been the standard bearer. And so I think what we're seeing right now is a lot of people who have been historically silenced getting an opportunity to say what is, what is not okay 
um, and what is hurtful and harmful. And that is so uncomfortable. And as a Muslim Pakistani American, I also worry about it in my own books. Like, am I going to get canceled? Did I write something wrong? Am I doing it right? I think it's, there is a degree of healthiness in questioning yourself and wondering. And I also want to say that I also want um, people to challenge the notion of getting canceled because most of the time there's not really much canceling happening. Um, Twitter is a small slice of the world at large. An example, just because JK Rowling is the current one who's been in the main headlines, she's gonna do just fine. Her books are gonna stay in print for a long, long time. She's gonna remain very, very rich and people are going to love her books and go to Harry Potter world. She's not canceled, um, but she is being challenged and she's being questioned and people are not just taking what she says at face value because what she said is very, very harmful to communities who are already under so much stress and threat. And so I think I just wanted to kind of address that part of it, that it is, it is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for me too, to see the conversations, but I think they're important and it's very new that these conversations are happening. Um, and so sometimes if we don't have something to say, we can listen. But I think um, I think there is a purpose and a point, and I and I think that they they are healthy to have those conversations. Thank you so much. Um, just to change gears a little bit, um, uh, just getting back to writing the perfect children's book. Um, it's often said that one of the biggest challenges to writing for kids is um, nailing that voice. Um, so, what do you do as adult writers to kind of stay in that kid voice? So let's see. I think we're starting with Aisha. I can let someone else go. I just did a lot. Of oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Laura <laughs> wants to go. Yeah. Um, I do a few things to get into the voice. I read a lot of middle grade. I read a lot of books in general, uh, a lot of magical middle grade, a lot of creepy middle grade, but I also read thrillers and different things, different age ranges. Um, but I really try and read a lot of middle grade. So I make sure that that I am on the pulse of it. I also, from my years as a classroom teacher and then my last couple of years in education, I was an instructional coach. So I was in a lot of different classrooms working with teachers. I just listen to kids, talk to kids, listen to them. Uh, my daughter is coming into that age. So I really pay attention to her. And then I've even pulled out uh, from my middle school box of stuff, some of my journal entries, my super awkward, just thoughts and feelings from that time and <laughs> tried to remember what it was like when I was that age. My book, The Circus of Stolen Dreams, deals with a family uh, whose parents are getting divorced. And my parents got divorced when I was 12. So I went and I looked back at how I was thinking and feeling during that time because I wanted to really represent that experience as accurately as I could with, with the pain of it and the hurt of it and also the hopefulness that things will get better. But I, I dug into my, my own childhood too, in addition to all these other inputs. What about you, Rebecca? Um, so I actually usually discover um, character voice just by writing. That is really the only way I have found, although it's often a, um, <laughs> a painful way to go. I don't want to say maybe painful is overstating it, but perhaps not. Mm -hmm. um, I often write with a tiny germ of an idea. I don't have any kind of outline or big plan. Um, I'm usually writing from some kind of question in my head, um, something, you know, some territory that I want to explore, but I'm not sure how, I'm not sure what's going to happen. I don't know what the big moments are going to be. I don't know any of that. So I just start writing scenes and um, I try to write longhand at, at, in the beginning and because it keeps me moving forward instead of going back, which is always the instinct to go back and fiddle with stuff rather than forge ahead. Um, and so, I just write scenes um, and what happens is um, sort of, you know, these characters start emerging. I notice that when these two characters talk, there's something that feels real and interesting happening. Um, and I, I basically, I write the whole first draft that way. And it often is not something that tracks chronologically. It's not the shape of a book. If you look at those story structure graphs, 
there's no way to <laughs> to line it up. But um, that's where I begin. It's I sort of begin with a zero draft. It's just creating raw material, um, and that is all about building character and finding the voice of the, of the character. And it, so I kind of do it by feel. Um, and again, I don't um, I don't have preconceptions about what my character is allowed to think or say. Um, it's all sort of organic to the process of discovery that comes from writing pages. Uh, even if I am not in the mood to write any pages, <laughs> that is really the only way um, that I have found to, to find characters um, that feel authentic. And honestly, the, the payoff with this kind of process is that I, I, I rarely then once I have found the character, I rarely um, stray. I, I don't, you know, um, have to revise one of the, I revise a ton, but one thing I don't have to do usually is think about the way my character talks, because that is the thing I have discovered in the, in the first draft. And that then just becomes something that is usually working for my story. <laughs> And my stories in which, as Aisha was saying, like I too love books where officially nothing happens. And, you know, <laughs> I've certainly read reviews of my books where people say nothing happens. And um, I, I don't take that very hard because those are often some of my favorite kinds of books. And um, so a lot about being a working writer, I think, is just accepting who you are as a writer. Not that we can't learn, we do, we grow, but there are certain things that that really don't seem to change very much. What yeah, I you, think, um, oh yeah, sorry, go ahead, Michael. Oh no, you can go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just gonna co-sign what everybody else said. It's the same exact thing for me. <laughs> it's like, you read a, read a lot in the genre and, um, and, and see where the voice leads you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think I come from a from a, a little bit of a different angle. Um, I tend to start with the with a big the big idea first, what the story's about, and and then like as I'm writing it, the character starts to reveal itself. But I've I've begun to understand that almost every character I write is really me. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Um, and they're like they're dealing with something that I'm still struggling with from when I was a kid. I mean, that my childhood was somewhat Dickensian. It was um, a lot of divorces, a lot of violence. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time in homeless shelters and battered uh, women's shelters when I was a kid. And we were very poor. Um, and um, so the, even though I've never written a story with a character quite like that. Um, I tend to write stories where the kids are struggling with their identities or, or they're, um, they're um, trying to recover a, a, a parent, a missing parent. Um, that, that was a, a my parents um, were never missing, but they were never really there either. And uh, so I, I tend to write stories about kids. Like, it's a, I think maybe one of the best things about writing for middle grade is the first thing you got to do is get rid of the parents. Um, <laughs> then so, you know, like ten, the, ten, the children tend to want, um, they're on a search for them, um, which is, I guess, so, you know, sort of a metaphor for me. Um, uh, but I would say the one thing I do before I, I, really dig into it to really capture the voice of what I'm trying to do is I go back and I watch some of the the films I loved when I was a kid um something like the Goonies um or um the first Indiana Jones movie or uh, you know those kind of things were really really inspiring to me as a child E.T. um I think they helped me get back into that sort of innocence of childhood um, the place that I really want to start from. And um, it also, they're fun and, and trying to do each time is really give you something really fun, but slip in some heart. Uh, hopefully you won't notice. 
Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'd say I'm, all the characters are me or somebody that I, that I loved. Um, and also like, you know, it's, it's nice that I have a 12 year old son and my girlfriend's daughter is 11. So I get to, they help me with the slang and everything. So. <laughs> Awesome. Okay, for our final question, um, I was wondering if you all would share your number one tip uh, for someone who's interesting in, interested in writing for kids. So we'll start with Rebecca. Hmm. Um, what is my number one tip? I, I've been trying to kind of slip them in here and there, but um, I think that I have my two basic <laughs> rules for writing um, for kids it are one, trust yourself. Um, I think that um, the, something that writers struggle with a lot, no matter what they're writing, is um, a lack of trust in, in yourself. And um, there's a, a lot of sort of censorship, self-censorship um, that goes on. And we all have an instinct, and I think this might loom larger when you're writing for children, um, to, to sort of present um, a sheltered or, or sort of happy airbrushed view of childhood or of internal experience. Like, you know, you're a good person, so you only want good things, you know, to happen to the people in your life. And, and I'm a big fan of, sort of throwing in all of the emotions of childhood, including the less attractive ones, um, because I think that, I don't know, for me, it was a big uh, deal to read for kids, uh, to read about kids who had like, you know, dark emotions. Like I loved A Wrinkle in Time, but one of the things I loved about it was how negative Meg felt um, uh, about herself. And that was something that um, I didn't really talk about with the people in my life. So number one, trust yourself. Um, really turn down what the writer Miranda July calls the voices of the local authorities um, when you're writing. So don't let anyone inside your head tell you that, you know, anything about what you're writing. Just turn those voices all the way down. You can turn them up again later when you're revising. Um, but when you are generating material, turn it down. And my second rule is um, to trust your, trust your readers. So don't um, really resist the urge to explain. Um, and I guess along with that, you know, goes the idea that kids don't really need to hear your answers or your your message most of the time. Um, like anyone, they are looking for an authentic reading experience, whether it is sort of a wild ride of a story or something really quiet about day-to-day -day life and feelings and family relationships. Um, it, it sort of, no matter what kind of story you're reading, I think that, um, kids can, can really do a lot of what I call reader's work. And they can draw their own conclusions. They have their own opinions. Um, I always try to write books in which kids might have different opinions about whether someone is doing the right thing or not. Um, and so, yeah, trust yourself, trust your readers. I love it. What about you, Michael? Well, I, I, um, I subscribe to one philosophy and I tell people this when they ask all the time. Um, you have to embrace the delicious joy of troublemaking. Um, this age group from eight to 12 is, is the time when you get into the most trouble and you should be writing about that. And um, if your character doesn't, break something or do something selfish or do some horrible dumb mistake um you're probably not writing a book that any kid's ever going to care about and like your characters have to make blunderous mistakes 
and 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 sometimes those mistakes there's no apology for no one would ever accept but you, you still have to throw it in there because that's what growing up is about is making mistakes and like even as an adult i make one every 15 minutes um and it's important to let them know that that's that's the part of it but also like you know how much fun it is to get into trouble <laughs> and um i think that that really appeals to a lot of kids and the, and i think what happens is they're given a lot of books that are really well intentioned and sweet and they have lovely messages about how to be honest and courageous and and um, um but i think the things that always stuck with me weren't weren't the preachy ones but the ones where the kid got into a whole truckload of trouble and figured his way out it's just as simple as that and like that's that's what you should be writing at least in my opinion aisha um i think my number one <clears throat> advice would be to read read a lot of books in the genre in the age range that you want to write um when i realized that my my middle, my young adult book, I'm all unbound was actually not a young adult book. It was a middle grade book because of the voice. The first thing I did was educate myself on it. And I read and read um, tons of books. And I think that really helps you know what's out there. It helps you know what's not out there. Um, and it helps you see how other, other authors um, tackle voice. Like right now, my, um, my camera is being held up by lots of great books like Celia Perez's Strange Birds, um, When Stars Are Scattered by Victoria Jameson and Omar Muhammad, Brown Girl Dreaming by Jacqueline Woodson. And I promise this is really, I didn't do this on purpose, but this book too. <laughs> um, the list of things that will not change. I've just finished reading and I love it. Um, Aww, and so it's you. just, uh, it's just, uh, just read, read what's out there read the classics, examine them too. And, and some of them are still great, um, but read the new stuff that's out there too. So that, um, so that you're aware of what's, what's going on. And Lorelai. I think I've got <laughs> a top two tips. Uh, my first one was something that I didn't personally think, but I've just come across it a little bit. Just because maybe you want to write books for kids doesn't mean that it's easier to write books for kids. Um, I had to work unbelievably hard for many years on craft of writing. And so I say this to anyone wanting to write in any age, work on your craft, work on how you create pictures with words in people's minds, whether that's through finding critique partners, people who can read your manuscript, whose opinions you trust, who can help you become better. I have been involved with both Author Mentor Match and Pitch Wars, and both of those have shaped and informed me as a writer. If you can find a mentor, that's, that can be great. Find craft books that are helpful for you in addition to reading a lot. So I, I definitely think that that was one of the biggest learning curves for me was just how much I had to learn to get the idea in my head to actually make sense and be a good story. Then the other piece of advice that I would give is something that I do every time I think up an idea for a book. And I do intend to stick with middle grade for the foreseeable future. So this may not apply to somebody who writes for multiple age ranges or might not apply to every person in general. But I always think about what kind of stories do I want to put out into the world? What kinds of things do I want to say? Because once you have books out there, like they're floating out there, you know, for the foreseeable future, these things that you've written are available to be found. Um, and so for me, that pulse check has come down to a Chesterton quote that I have above my fireplace that says, fairy, fairy tales are more than true not because they tell us that dragons exist, but because they tell us that dragons can be beaten. And so every story that I write, the things that I'm passionate about have a dragon of some sort. It's not a dragon literally, but it's some sort of a dragon. And then there's always that hope at the end of the day. And I always frame all of my pitches and my manuscripts are like, is this a story that's gonna show a kid that good can win the day? And that even though things might get really scary and really hard, 
that, that they can triumph in the end. And that pulse and that, that message you want to put out in the world might change for every person. It might change between books, but like that's, I found that for me and that's been really helpful to be like, okay, these are the kinds of stories I, as an author, am going to write. Oh, thank you so much. I feel like everyone has just really breathed so much um, into this conversation. And I feel like there's so much I'll be thinking about long after um, this is over. So thank you writers so much for sharing your journey with us. And thank you viewers for joining us at Book Summer Live. Um, until next time, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>